Welcome back. So what's your opinion on that question? Which category, which generation of human rights do we have here? If you take a careful look at this passage in the judgment of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, what we notice is that the court interpreted Article 21 of the American Convention in a sense that allowed it to apply Article 21 as a third generation human right, a collective right in that case. So in fact, what the court did is that it turned a typical first generation human right, the right to property, which is one of the classical fundamental freedoms, the court turned it into a third generation human right, into a collective right, which is rather interesting. And this is one of the central reasons why the Quechua indigenous people of Sarayak who won that case in front of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Let me now turn to another question, the question of whether the golden age of human rights, which began some 75 years ago with the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, has passed its zenith. Is this golden age about to end or is it already over? Kenyan American legal scholar Makao Mutua addresses this question in an interesting article published in 2016. Let me quote from that article. The last half of the 20th century after World War II was undoubtedly the golden era of human rights. No less an authority than Louis Henkin, one of the key intellectual fathers of the modern human rights movement, dubbed the period the Age of Rights. He wrote that human rights is the idea of our time, the only political moral idea that has received universal acceptance. Philip Alston, a leading contemporary scholar of human rights, has argued that naming a claim a human right elevates it above the rank and file of competing societal goals and bestows upon it an aura of timelessness, absoluteness and universal validity. These are strong claims. What is not in doubt is the cascade of norms, processes and institutions propagating human rights since World War II. These mushroomed everywhere at the universal, regional and national levels. The United Nations became the global champion of the human rights crusade around the world. The work of the UN was buttressed by regional human rights systems in Africa, Europe and the Americas. Within states, national constitutions increasingly took the normative content of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other key international human rights texts. Seen from this perspective, it is difficult to argue that the human rights idea was not phenomenally successful. But it would be foolish to pretend without any qualification that the 20th century was indeed the human rights epoch. Even as the seeds and sinews of human rights were planted worldwide, the last half of the century proved to be one of the brutal eras of our time. Genocides were committed in many countries, including Cambodia, Yugoslavia, Iraq, China, Rwanda and Uganda. Unspeakable crimes were carried out in many other countries, including Argentina, Chile and South Africa. By the end of the century, much of the enthusiasm that had characterized the search of the human rights movement had cooled down. Human rights seemed to have failed to deliver a utopian world. Creeds and ideologies that overpromise and inevitably underperform are destined to suffer public fatigue. Human rights is one such ideology. There has been a messianic germ in human rights, widely shared within the human rights movement, particularly in international non-governmental organizations based in the West. Within these circles and the foreign policy establishments of the West, 
The fundamental belief in human rights has been an article of faith. The human rights movement largely remains a cultural possession of the West, in spite of the adoption of its language by activists in the global South. It is undeniable that human rights, a distinctly Western construct, was a subtle continuum of the civilizing mission of the West against its former colonial possessions in the global South. Human rights were a Western crusade of the white middle and upper classes in Europe and the United States. The core belief of these classes was no different from that of their colonizing forefathers of yesteryear. Like the colonial mission, they thought that human rights would deliver primitive peoples into the age of Europe. In the view of human rights missionaries, their ideology promised happiness and the glimpse of eternity. This triumphalism has not completely ended. The universality of human rights has also been undermined by the double standards, what critics see as hypocrisy, of the West. This is the case of preaching water but drinking wine. The West has been accused of being guilty of the same abuses of human rights that it condemns other states for perpetuating. During much of the Cold War, the West coddled right-wing fascist dictatorships across the globe. More recently, the US-led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have exposed the duplicity of the West. Finally, the indefinite detention of Al-Qaeda suspects in Guantanamo, in what is effectively a legal black hole, seriously dents the claim that the United States is a rule of law state. The war on terror and security concerns overtook human rights as a global language after the terrorist attacks on the United States on September 11, 2001. The United States in particular seemed determined to go to any length to justify human rights violations in the name of fighting terror. Authoritarian dictatorships took American flouting of international law as carte blanche to commit the most heinous human rights atrocities. In Chechnya, Russia unleashed a savage war on the population in the name of fighting terror. Israel, Sudan, Zimbabwe and many others were now free to bring the hammer down harder on peoples under their control. The human rights movement overpromised but underperformed its large claims and promises as being the antidote to human catastrophes have not been borne out. The more recent catastrophes in Syria, North Korea, Central African Republic and Sudan, to mention only a few of the many desperate cases, point to the inability of the human rights movement to usher in an era of human civility and prosperity. The bad news is that the world, including the West and the UN, are paralyzed and unable to do anything to change the horrific facts on the ground. It is this inertia and powerlessness that have taken the luster out of human rights. Nothing has replaced human rights as the universal inspirational ideology or philosophy. The end of the human rights era has left the world with a moral vacuum. The story behind international human rights law is extraordinary. It's a story full of hope, inspiration, enthusiasm, exceptionally high promises, but also full of contradictions, controversies, disappointments, hypocrisy, and sometimes arrogance. This is where we are now, and where are we going? What future for human rights? Let's be clear, as long as we live in a world of modern nation-states that are potentially all-powerful and potentially totalitarian, we are in need of the protection that human rights can offer. 
We need human rights as a means of defending people, individuals and also communities, especially indigenous people's communities, against overwhelming state power and in some cases also against overwhelming corporate power. For example, in the struggle of indigenous peoples against multinational oil and mining corporations. But do we need to blindly follow human rights missionaries in all their naive beliefs? Do we need to totally fall for their pseudo-religious enthusiasm and zeal? Do we need to fully embark on a global civilizing mission seeking to universally impose current ideas and ideologies as absolute standards of human civilization? Perhaps the world would be a better place if we adopted less of a sure-to-be-right attitude, if we took a more self-critical, more cautious and more culturally respectful approach.